really stoked to talk to y'all about uh, using ACT and internal family systems and some other evidence-based techniques to work on burnout uh, and compassion fatigue uh, within the larger field of, of mental health. So uh, we're going to just kind of hop into it because I think all of our perfectionism kicked in in the last week and we have a ton of slides and a lot of content that we're really excited to go through with you today. So uh, just a couple of, uh, you know, check-in items here. All of our material discusses clinical interventions, principles uh, that are, you know, based on our literature review, our own clinical expertise, and our own training. Uh, as with all of the things we talk about today, please be thoughtful about applying these skills without the appropriate training. We're going to provide some resources for where to get training if these approaches interest you. And as far as risks, we don't have any, you know, real uh, intense uh, risk to make you aware of at this time. Of course, you know, we're talking about burnout, self-care, uh, you know, kind of loosely uh, talking about like trauma and resilience. And so some emotional distress is possible. Uh, and so just be aware of that as we uh, kind of talk about applying this to your life. Uh, as far as conflicts of interest go, I don't think we have any of those and we're not receiving commercial support for any of the things we talk about today. Awesome. Well, just uh, giving you all a, you know, a little taste of who we are and kind of where we come from. Let's take a look now at, at what we're going to talk about today. So, so here's our ambitious uh, funnel of kind of what we're going to cover. So we're going to start off, you know, defining burnout, taking a look at factors that impact burner at burnout as mental health professionals. We're going to, you know, look at some models for understanding and preventing burnout offered by you know, APDA and also some aspirational frameworks for how to maybe move uh, in a more thriving direction rather than just a burnout prevention model. I think ACT and IFS are both wonderful tools for that. So we're going to talk about what ACT is uh, and then try to link, you know, ACT and IFS concepts to burnout. So ACT, acceptance and commitments therapy, IFS, internal family systems. And we're going to also weave in some experiential exercises, some reflection throughout this, and, and hopefully get a little bit of participation from you to the extent that technology and time uh, per, uh, permit. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers, and we'll also provide resources for additional training and uh, just learning that you can that you can grab. All right. So we are going to start, you know, we have a, a really wide range of professionals here, and I'd love to capitalize on that wisdom. And I'm curious, how would you define burnout? Um, if you want to put a couple of answers in the chat, looking for just like a few words, but, you know, we throw this word around a lot. It's, you know, I think I heard it for the first time in my clinical training early on in graduate school. And so I'd like to hear, you know, kind of what you define as burnout, what burnout feels like. Uh, and I'll just kind of pay attention to the chat here before we move forward. Yeah, I see Samantha saying weary, numb, apathy, lack of interest, loss. Excellent words. I can uh, identify with all of those. Overstimulated, high stress, yeah. Exhaustion, not being able to tend to client needs because of my own. Yeah, feel that one. Yeah. Indifference, yeah, that's a big one we're going to talk about today. Awesome. So these are uh, these are wonderful little definitions as we kind of like get into this. It sounds like, you know, we've all experienced this. We have some understanding of it. I'm just going to throw up and briefly talk about, you know, what APA offers is, you know, their their kind of official definition of burnout. So emotional or mental exhaustion that's accompanied by decreased motivation, lowered performance and negative attitudes towards oneself, uh, typically resulting from kind of prolonged contact with high stress. And then the mental and physical fallout that kind of comes from that. So, you know, interesting when I was looking at this, uh, it, it, I guess it was first used in 1975 by a, a psychologist named Herbert Freudenberger. I might have just butchered that. Uh, and he was working, uh, referencing workers who had really high caseloads. And so, you know, most often burnout is, is uh, observed in individuals who have service-oriented vocations, social workers, teachers, you know, even correctional officers, physicians, and they experience, you know, or at least come into contact with high levels of stress. One of the, you know, I think interesting things about burnout is that it's really difficult to identify before you're in the middle of it, right? We talk about, you know, awareness of it and kind of, you know, how we can prevent it, but, you know, in looking at this research and talking to my colleagues, 
there there was this emerging theme that you know burnout is 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 tough to prepare for until you catch it and it usually takes a while to catch it like you're in burnout for a while you feel this way before you start naming it and start actively trying to like you know get away from it reduce it or, or change it so there's a you know there's actually you know an entire pretty dedicated field of research that has you know tried to objectively observe and understand burnout from the Maslow burnout inventory, which is a, a a kind of the gold standard measure from what I could find uh, on measuring occupational burnout. They look at you know three components that make up burnout. So exhaustion uh, refers to ongoing physical and emotional exhaustion. This fatigue kind of extends beyond what we would consider you know, what would be alleviated with like a, just a single day of self-care, right? So like a good night of sleep is not going to like cure burnout. That's the kind of exhaustion that that really makes up burnout. Uh, it's this like chronic, you know, kind of low, uh, low motivation feeling. Cynicism is another component. So this is that, you know, indifference that I saw uh, kind of brought up a lot in the chat where you just, you don't have anything more to give, right? You're, you, you may even develop some negative ad attitudes towards people, uh, towards your clients, even towards yourself, but just kind of this like irritable, pessimistic, cynical view that things are not going to get better. Uh, this often manifests itself as just like a lack of joy, blaming others for mediocre performance. Uh, they they had this, uh, one of their definitions was seeing the world through rust covered glasses, which I thought was interesting. Uh, the final, you know, component that this inventory looks at is impaired effectiveness. So this is not feeling accomplished uh, due to lack of rewards, so there's both like the perception of impaired effective of, of impaired effectiveness and the reality of impaired effectiveness, which are often two different things. Uh, I think most of us are pretty high achieving, hold ourselves to high standards, as Rachel said earlier. Where uh, many of us are, you know, recovering perfectionists, and so uh, you know, understanding like at what point are you truly becoming less effective versus just not meeting your standards is often difficult. And I think that's a I think that's definitely reality in burnout. So. Uh, we also, you know, had a wonderful question uh, that came in about a week ago from Peter Martin, who asked about the difference between uh, compassion fatigue and over identification. So uh, first off, like, I guess I would say that both compassion fatigue and over identification fall under the umbrella of burnout, right? So this feeling of exhaustion, cynicism, impaired effectiveness. Uh, negative attitudes towards oneself, like both of those are, you know, I guess synonyms or, you know, uh, maybe individual constructs. And, you know, as I, I was kind of thinking about this question, looking up uh, some some resources for this, I, I think my response to that question is that it, it looks like there's kind of like a continuum here, right, of compassion fatigue versus over-identification. So on the one hand, you know, we intellectually all understand what compassion is, feeling uh, feeling for someone, maybe even sharing some aspect of that emotion, having empathy, right? And those are qualities that are really reinforced among mental health practitioners. Compassion fatigue results from maybe feeling too frequently, right? Uh, feeling with or for coming into contact with emotions, having your own kind of emotions rise and fall too frequently to the point where you have to depersonalize uh, or kind of step away, numb yourself, right? Essentially engage in avoidance. Um, you know, either behaviorally or internally. And so I, I think about compassion fatigue is like that first place where you're trying to get distance, you're not really having effective limits, um, but like, and, and that exhaustion is setting in. Over-identification is kind of the more extreme end of the spectrum where rather than feeling for someone you are, uh, or, or feeling with someone, you are taking on those emotions to such an extent that you're losing your own objectivity. So over-identification is uh, really taking on emotions, blurring the boundary between the, yourself and your own emotional experience and the person that you're working with. And that's a really dangerous form of burnout, right? Uh, that's really where we see your performance get affected, uh, your ability to provide competent quality services, work towards evidence-based treatments. Those are all going to be significantly impacted if you're in that like over-identification phase. So those are just some some uh, initial de uh, definitions. There was a uh, meta-analysis that I'm, I'm going to comment on in my next slide uh, that talked about this, but I, I I just wanted to highlight that you know among mental health practitioners, 
we are particularly at risk for burnout. So uh, this meta-analysis uh, from O'Connor in 2018, they looked at 62 studies that measured burnout among mental health practitioners. They looked at different factors that led to or were associated with burnout. And one thing that really stood out to me was that mental health practitioners had higher rates of you know, emotional exhaustion in particular, but burnout kind of overall. Uh, even relative to like other careers that we would associate with being a burned out. So like mental health practitioners were significantly reported significantly higher burnout than palliative care nurses, uh, than emergency room nurses, and, and they actually had pretty comparable rates to folks in oncology, physicians, nurses, um, and other people who are directly involved in oncology. So, you know, there's there's definitely like a shared element of coming into contact with a lot of, you know, emotional suffering and pain there, but I, I thought that that was just interesting. So when we talk about what affects burnout, uh, you know, I, I like to look to the literature first and then kind of draw from my own clinical experience. This meta-analysis did a really, really nice job of being able to point to specific factors and kind of like pull apart some myths about burnout. So overall, this meta-analysis noted that uh, the biggest contributing factor was a higher workload. Um, so overall, just a higher workload, more responsibilities at work, more cases. Um, and I, I noted that they used the word responsibility. So it wasn't just like a specific number of clients. It's like, man, how much are you doing? What other things are you doing? Charting, presentations, uh, you know, supervision, consultation, meetings, all of that, like that overall workload is, workload is what led to burnout on average. And I think many of us who've, who've been in large organizations can pro probably relate to that, uh, uh, relate to that kind of determinant of burnout. Uh, another key factor in increasing burnout was this sense of job control. How much freedom do you have? Folks with lower autonomy who are, uh, you know, kind of viewed themselves or, or at least self-reported not having a lot of influence in their job uh, had higher rates of burnout. The, if you didn't feel like you could make a change or advocate for yourself, that was a really, really strong predictor across uh, all you know, mental health practitioners and a really big takeaway from this. Then there were uh, you know, some more relationship focused things. Um, so lack of supervision uh, increased burnout and they even expanded supervision to just, to just say like, do you have a trusted colleague? Uh, so you know, those of us in uh, private practice or solo practice, like this is something to definitely pay attention to. Do you have supervision? Do you have consultation, someone to lean on. Other big factors determining uh, burnout were relationships. So having role conflict or just ambiguity, unresolved conflict, you know, some of those things that are I think common across most workplaces, uh, but they were also particularly strong among mental health practitioners. Another factor, you know, so just some kind of like uh, I guess tertiary factors. So these can be both causes and or uh, contributors and outcomes for burnout or health conditions. So in particular, gastrointestinal distress, sleep problems, weakened immune system, and substance use were all contributing factors to burnout and were also outcomes of burnout. So there was kind of a, a two-way relationship there. Uh, personality factors like perfectionism often contributed to burnout. So, uh, you know, if you had beliefs about yourself, things, uh, you know, I don't know, speaking for a friend here, but if I don't over-prepare for this presentation, I'm going to get a bad reputation. Uh, so then, you know, behaviorally, maybe I like sacrifice meaningful activities within work or outside of work, client prep, exercise, my, you know, post-supper walk with my dog uh, to do this like burnout engaging task. So, you know, perfectionism can definitely be a, a thing that relates to burnout as well. Uh, another just kind of final takeaway from these, uh, you know, factors that impacted burnout was uh, mental health practitioners, uh, even when they kind of compared it to other, uh, other, other occupations, had tended to develop kind of a limited insight into their own burnout. So what that looked like was they, they noted that about 40% of folks reported high mental exhaustion. 22% uh, also re reported like depersonalization, right? So there's like two of the three really big keys for, uh, for burnout. And yet 
among those people, 78% reported that they were still having like a strong sense of professional competence and personal uh, and personal accomplishment, right? So there's they noted that that's kind of a risk for uh, you know burnout, blindness, uh, or just having limited insight into how effective you are, or uh, maybe even potentially more problematic, like this sense that you have to keep going no matter what, right? So one thing I, I wanted to do as we kind of move forward here is to have you all take a minute here on a Friday and ask yourself, how burned out are you right now? And I note that it's the end of the week, so I'm not sure if that's going to be a protective factor or maybe we're going to skew towards high because we've all had a full week. <laughs> All right. Just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll probably move this forward, but I'll note that roughly 75% of us are medium to highly burned, burned out, right? Which kind of maps onto the literature, right? We're all, you know, kind of at risk for this. We have many things going on and we have this sense of, you know, kind of needing to tolerate it. So as we move forward, we're going to talk about kind of this ethical imperative uh, I think can tell if this is on. Okay, it is on my screen. Um, this ethical imperative for self care. So we often recognize it as important. Uh, as professional psychologists, oh man, uh, Jen, can we turn off the poll because it keeps popping up on my end? Thank you. Uh, so as professional psychologists, you know we're we're really committed to caring for others. We're highly reinforced by you know, other people improving, developing care strategies uh, for themselves. And I, you know, as I was thinking about this presentation, I had a lot of like, man, I do a lot of like, do as I say, not as I do moments when I think about self-care with my clients. So, you know, there's this tension between like, hey, we, we know what the strategies are, and yet it's difficult to really integrate that into our lives. We're, uh, you know, in looking at the the ethics of, you know, kind of the ethical imperative for this, you know, we have a, a wide range of people here uh, who follow different ethics codes. So we've got, you know, APA, we have the social work code, um, we have some counselors, um, marriage and family therapists. So I, I just kind of collected all of these and looked at some of the difference here, differences here. But, you know, as a DBT therapist, I, I really like, I see dialectics everywhere. And I'm particularly sensitive to polarizations. I know in my life, many of my closest colleagues' lives, we kind of treat burnout like it's this like elephant graveyard and Lion King. You know, you're just like, just don't go there. Don't go there under any circumstances. Uh, but sometimes, you know, I, I've found myself wondering like, man, like we all are experiencing this. So this is really a common problem. Like, are we missing something? What's the other side here? And as I looked at the ethics codes, I, I kind of was struck by this, what I saw is like a polarization towards distress tolerance, right? So if you know dialectical behavior therapy, you know that there's several skills deficits that we address and we kind of see all of these skills as working together to build a life worth living. Distress tolerance is like this short-term skill that's designed to be like just for survival, right? Like, hey, just get through this 24 hours without making it worse and then we can work on other things to build a valued life. And as I looked at the ethics code, I it sounded a lot like burnout was kind of treated like this, hey, what you need to do is just tolerate this, right? So just looking at the, the codes, that, the parts of the code that stood out to me, they, there's, uh, you know, from the APA code for psychologists, uh, refrain from initiating activity when you know or should know that there's a substantial likelihood that your problems will prevent you from uh, working effectively. Uh, the psychologist code also says like, you know, you know, when your personal problems are interfere, remove yourself. And, and there's just this, you know, uh, really big sense of like, yeah, when you're not good, like get yourself out of there, pull yourself away, protect the other person from your pain at all costs, which is certainly like a really, really important ethical reminder. And as I reflected on this in my clinical practice, like some of my most powerful moments of connection with clients have come from me sharing some kind of vulnerability, sharing a genuine reaction in those uh, in those sessions, noting like, hey, I'm not at my best. My daughter didn't sleep last night. I'm struggling. I know you're struggling. Like, let's struggle together. So I just wanted to highlight this uh, this kind of 
uh, contradiction and uh, this polarization that we have just even deeply ingrained in our field into our ethics code. Um, thinking back to that uh, quote that was that was listed just on the slide before, uh, that's attributed to uh, a rabbi. It's you know potentially like two thousand years old. Uh, it says, "If I'm not who, for myself, who will be for me? If I'm not, if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when?" I, I would love for you all to be mindful of this interplay between caring for yourself and caring for other people, and noting the contradictions that show up as we talk about this today. Uh, our presentation is going to be full of these dialectical contradictions because you know Rachel, Rada, and I are, are all dialectically trained uh, DBT clinicians that are. Uh, at least in some part of our training. So just please notice your reactions and, and contemplate this question like, you know, if it's not now, then when? Um, and so returning to our IPA ethics codes, for the psychologists out there, you can notice this like urge or like push towards distress tolerance. And then you look at the social workers code and it is like right away, right off the bat, professional self-care is paramount. Uh, we've got a... Uh, really, sorry, I'm trying to catch my notes up here. Um, we have a really in, a strong encouragement to promote organizational policies, practices, and develop systems of self-care. That's one one thing that really stood out to me was that there were uh, there's an incur a direct encouragement to not only like pay attention and work on self-care, but like make it work for you. And then we have another like encouragement. From our uh, from our social work ethics code to have work for organizations and have organizations reflect on uh, you know how their burnout is doing and if they're becoming barriers to burnout or uh, if you're actively encouraging self care. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, marriage and family therapy uh, ethics code was relatively brief on uh, at least on what I could find um, in terms of encouraging self care. Talked about maintaining high professional standards of competence and integrity, which definitely connects to this idea of self care. And then uh, you know preventing issues that may impair work. So again, so this 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 idea of like pull yourself away, avoid, separate, tolerate. Uh, and the American Counseling Association also uh, you know seemed to mirror. Uh, what the APA said, uh, monitor yourself, remove yourself, um, and, you know, also encourage your colleagues to kind of help you monitor yourself. So uh, I'm going to speak, you know, a lot to, the, you know, the APA psychologist code. That's the code that I, uh, you know, follow and was trained on. And just looking at this, uh, you know, I, I kind of noted that uh, it seems like the ethical imperative to for self-care is really, you know, kind of tied to competence and how competence is rose, is woven in throughout our uh, throughout our code. So, uh, some things that stood out to me: uh, practicing only in areas where uh, within the boundaries of your competence, and then making an ongoing effort to develop and maintain your competence. Being aware of the effect of your own mental health. Uh, and protecting those that you work with from, from this idea. So keeping these things in mind that competence is kind of our, you know, our closest like direct ethical imperative, uh, we can see that there's, you know, this polarization towards uh, distress tolerance or towards just tolerating and preventing rather than, um, you know, focusing on uh, building, you know, more effective systems to allow you to thrive. And so, you know, as I dug in a little bit deeper, uh, I noticed that there's this uh, model for uh, kind of, I guess, understanding burnout. So this comes from the Board of Professional Affairs uh, Advisory Committee on Colleague Assistance. And they, you know, describe this as a downward spiral, right? That stress is stress is a normal experience uh, in a workplace. Uh, and then it kind of can, it has the potential to spiral down here. And so, again, like things that stood out to me here were this idea that uh, there's there's only a neutral to negative understanding of burnout rather than, you know, again, something uh, that's more focused on uh, flourishing, thriving, right? So this idea that like, we're all expected to survive, to tolerate uh, rather than uh, rather than thrive. So looking at this model, uh, stress was, you know, defined as a natural body reaction to internal and external demands. Distress was kind of our reactions to that stress, right? So the facial expressions, the behaviors, the things that we do when we're experiencing distress. Impairment is maybe that first, you know, true sign of like problematic burnout. 
where you're seeing an observable change in your function. Maybe this is the point where depersonalization kicks in. Uh, you aren't able to effectively empathize, reflect, maybe even guide your clients due to that like uh, kind of irritable feeling, that cynical feeling that shows up. And then we move into improper behavior. And so, you know, the, the overarching theme here is if you don't manage one of these kind of progressive stages well and get yourself back up, then it's going to, you know, keep, keep pulling you down. We have, um, again, like what calls to mind is the short-term strategy of holding all of this and then, uh, you know, kind of like Atlas. And, you know, in DBT, we talk a lot about like, look, the absence of pain does not equal a life worth living, right? And yet in our ethics code, you know, in, in, this, uh, in this model, it's entirely focused on just reducing pain, right? Trying to get yourself back to zero. Uh, but zero doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to sustain a career as a mental health practitioner. And I, I see that as a really major limitation of this module, that it goes only from neutral to negative. It's entirely focused on survival. So today, we're going to envision a positive continuum. And this, this positive continuum comes from some really excellent, uh, there was a, a wonderful paper from Wise et al. in 2012, and it looked like that was also developed into a workshop. Uh, I believe the first author on this page, uh, at least at one time was the director of clinical training at North Carolina Chapel Hill. Um, I'm not sure if she still is currently. Uh, but really, I, I drew a lot from this uh, from this work, and I, I found it super helpful, and it was, you know, kind of the impetus for this presentation. So they talked about envisioning a positive continuum, right? So something on the other side here that, uh, something on the other side that we can kind of aspire to as psychologists. So the first step is, is shifting this mindset from surviving and preventing and tolerating distress to how can I thrive? How can I flourish uh, in this environment, in this career with my clients? Um, can we ask ourselves, like, what would it take to be the kind of mental health practitioner that I want to be in this context, right? Not how can I get my charting done or how can I, you know, achieve, you know, a certain, you know, monetary money, but like, how can I truly be this uh, be this, you know, kind of practitioner. They then move from, you know, that mindset shift into being intentional and intentionally choosing meaningful self-care for you, right? Uh, you'll notice that I don't think, uh, you know, besides maybe a love of outdoors and nature, Rada, Rachel, and I both, like, are, all three of us had different, uh, different self-care strategies just noted on our pictures there, right? Um, so uh, being willing to be intentional in choosing self-care time and time again, uh, and being willing to change your attitudes and practice. This means turning away from things that are actively increasing your burnout. Uh, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, man, that that urge to like stay up and chart till like 11 p.m. when you get behind instead of having a dinner with your partner, you know, getting a good night's sleep and then working that extra charting time into your week, right? Just simple things, being intentional, choosing self-care over like this tolerate distress a little bit longer mentality. This is the, the next piece here is the one where I, I expect that you'll have some reactions or you'll uh, maybe even give a little bit of pushback. And I want to encourage that like kind of dialectical reaction here. So reciprocity, they, they defined in, in envisioning this positive continuum as the ethical and authentic exchange of beneficial life strategies between the mental health provider and the client, right? So this idea that, you know, you're in the boat too, you're a human as well. Let's talk about what works for you. I'm going to tell you what works for me and let's exchange these beneficial lifestyles. Um, this idea of, of not separating your, uh, your ability to thrive from your client's uh, kind of struggle or, or goal and growth, growth areas of, uh, of learning, to, learning to thrive as well. Uh, there was a cool quote uh, I liked. So the, you know, this was this idea of reciprocity was was developed from looking at some pretty extensive extensive research on therapeutic lifestyle changes, uh, and they found that you know folks who uh, were actively using these therapeutic lifestyle changes were more likely to recommend them to their clients, and then their clients were more likely to actually do them as well. Um, this idea of a trusting relationship, getting advice from that. Uh, and actually like that being an active ingredient in behavior change uh, just kind of struck me. The, the author of the review had this to say about uh, the concept of reciprocity uh, in psychologists in particular. 
Um, he said, in contemplative disciplines, there's been this recognition that the health and maturity of the teacher is essential for cultivating the health and maturity of students. I assume that at some point, therapists will one day recognize this same link between themselves and their patients. Uh, and I just thought that was a really beautiful quote um, in thinking about the idea of reciprocity and how burnout reducing that would be. Uh, the final one is, is integrated into life. Uh, so this is the idea that these strategies, these things that you're doing to care for yourself and to really thrive as a mental health practitioner should be integrated into your life and not added on top of your already busy life, right? Like, you know, we've all probably had uh, clients or people in our life who are like, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to go five days a week. Uh, I'm just going to get up at 445 every day. And then I'm going to go to work for 10 hours. And then I'm going to come home and make dinner. And it's like, man, that at best lasts a week. At least it does for me. Um, more, more recently, it's been like 24 hours, if that, but, uh, you know, really thinking about how can you just integrate these principles into your life? How can you show yourself more compassion, uh, and, uh, work to build this into what's already happening rather than adding on top of that. Um, and if you're curious about how to like behaviorally do that, uh, there's a book atomic habits that has uh, synthesized a lot of behavioral research. Um, in habit forming, and it's really, 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 really good for learning how to integrate effective habits in your life. Uh, so I'll just plug that really quick. Um, obviously, this is a, a lovely aspirational model that sounds beautiful and sounds like something that we love. And as a behaviorally trained psychologist, I can't help but like immediately go, well, that's great, but like, what's the action plan for this? Like, how, like, what does flourishing actually look like? What's intentionality look like at the level of behavior every single day? And that's where acceptance and commitment therapy and internal family systems, I think, can really offer some guidance uh, to help us uh, help us put some actions uh, and evidence-based practices uh, to these to these goals. So we're going to move into talking about acceptance and commitment therapy with Rachel now. Wow, that was awesome, Jordan. Thank you so much. I feel like, I don't know if this is possible, but at this exact moment in time, I have a less of a subjective sense of my own personal burnout, just hearing you talk about these things. Um, I'm also just uh, experiencing a feeling of gratitude towards, um, uh, honestly, towards everybody who's here right now, but I would say just especially towards the two of you as we were doing this together, feeling grateful for our connectedness and, uh, you know, sense of teamwork at the center. So I really appreciate that. So, you know, we're, like Jordan said, we're feeling a little bit ambitious about the amount of content that we're going to cover today. And um, so we're going to kind of do, at least for me in talking about ACT, I'm going to do, you know, over overview stuff with a lot of emphasis on experiential learning, just because that's, um, it's my style. It's how I learn best. And it's pretty values consistent for me. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention a little bit of what we know about ACT for burnout specifically in the literature. So I just kind of summarized a few studies here. The cool thing is that a lot of this research is relatively new, um, which has pros and cons to it. On the upside, it's very recent. Um, so it's up to date. Uh, on the downside, it's still kind of burgeoning, like there are some limitations to the kinds of studies that are out there right now related to ACT, using ACT specifically for professional burnout. Um, the co one cool thing, at least cool in my opinion, is that um, a lot of the studies are really inclusive in terms of a, a wide variety of um, including a wide variety of different kinds of professions and professionals in a wide variety of settings. So um, I would say there's probably a lot of uh, ecological validity to these. Um, and in general, findings have shown that ACT for burnout uh, has shown decreases in psychological distress, reductions in burnout, and improved stress management. Um, some of the findings show that these come from two of our components uh, that are not, you, you know, only unique to ACT, but are certainly important parts of ACT. So mindfulness skills, as well as values-based behavior. And, um, you know, maybe this is like a regression to the mean kind, mean kind of a thing here, but um, what they also found is that ACT strategies were most effective for those with higher distress at baseline. 
Um, my interpretation of that is there's, uh, you know, more improvement to be made. Uh, I know I always feel really effective as a therapist when my clients are coming in with high distress because it's a little bit easier to see some immediate, um, immediate improvements. Um, so limitations, like I mentioned, small samples, uh, this is, this would be very act consistent, but they were not using well-defined or very specific protocols act as a process-based therapy. Um, there are some manuals out there that are a great way to like intro yourself to act. Um, but at its heart, it is, uh, flexible and contextual and process-based. And so I'm not surprised that that was a limitation. And I'm also not surprised that researchers want it to be a protocol. Um, and, uh, another limitation was that there wasn't really a lot of follow-up. So in terms of sustained effects in the long-term, we don't really know that now. Um, I went to a training, uh, gosh, this was like pre-pandemic days. This was uh, a while ago. I think it was down in Sandy with Steve Hayes. And um, he really introduced the ACT model in this way. And it's kind of how I've been thinking about it conceptually ever since. So a lot of times I think when people are learning ACT, um, they start with the nitty gritty down at the bottom here. And some of these like really heady, wordy, <laughs> uh, jargony terms like self as observer, self as context, cognitive diffusion, committed action. Um, as a therapist in practice, I rarely, if ever, use those terms with clients or colleagues, quite frankly, or myself. Um, and if I do, it's with intention. Um, it's because somebody is asking or wants to know. But a lot of times we're really translating this into the language that feels most comfortable with our clients. So for me, I really resonated with this idea that these six core processes uh, that are listed at the bottom here really load on to these three areas. So when I think about ACT and I like try and ground myself in the model, what I'm thinking about is being present, opening up, and doing what matters. And one of the downsides to getting lost in some of the nitty gritty or getting too deep into some of the processes that are there is that we lose the big picture, that the overarching goal of ACT is really increasing psychological flexibility. Meaning, um, you know, as humans, our brains and our minds want to get wired into these like automatic and habitual and comfortable patterns of doing things. And those things may or may not be workable in our lives, but can we, you know, be mindful? Can we be present and aware of what our menu of options are? Can we be open to the range of options that are out there? And then we can, can we choose with intention what's most important to us in that moment aligned with our values and do what matters about that. So this is a broad overview. We'll go um, a little bit more in depth, at least into kind of those three uh, subcategories there, but this six in three in one is how I tend to, you know, like I said, conceptualize and stay grounded in my mind. Um, and so as we go along here, we'll do some explicit connecting to burnout, but what I really would like for you all to be doing as we're going along is um, beginning to think about how the, how you think these concepts apply to things like burnout, compassion fatigue, and I really want you to think about this as self-application. Um, it's pretty, you know, different ACT practitioners practice really differently, but it's very common um, to, to hold a belief that um, you, are you are doing ACT with yourself as you are doing ACT with other people. Um, and we're really talking about professional burnout today. So I know our minds might wanna get pulled in the direction of applying to clients or things like that. Um, but I want you to see if you can uh, bring your mind back to yourself in this moment, like Jordan said, if not now, when, uh, and see if you can do some uh, experiential work throughout. Um, I also wanted to mention just a few uh, cultural considerations with ACT. I will say this is like one of the things that really draws me to the model. And I felt really encouraged when you were speaking earlier, Jordan, that a lot of 
a lot of these things about uh, what we know about making evidence-based practices inclusive for diverse populations were kind of there was like a little bit of a mirror here. So it's like, that's super cool. Um, I didn't really know that before you you were talking about that. Um, so this is, you know, not extensive or, or comprehensive by any means, but, you know, a couple of models that we are often thinking about when we're talking about cultural adaptations um, or adaptations to diverse populations have to do first and foremost with ecological validity as what I'm studying in the lab actually translate to the real world here. And um, this ecological validity model specifically talks about intervention adaptations that considers cultural dimensions of language, persons, metaphors, content, concepts, goals, methods, and context. We know ACT is all about context. Um, many of us might know ACT is all about the metaphors. If I like, it is just a part of how I talk now. Sometimes people just like, joke at the center, uh, if you need a metaphor, come talk to Rachel, or, you know, I can't even help myself in consultation sometimes, but um, that's a really big part of ACT. Um, and then in terms of research principles, this um, community-based participatory research is a model that that is sometimes used uh, as a way to um, make research more equitable, more collaborative, and to, uh, you know, like I said, um, include uh, important cultural adaptations. And a couple of the, or a few of the principles that are involved in this model specifically, again, map onto some of what you were saying here. So this co-learning and reciprocal, tra reciprocal transfer of expertise, um, which in ACT, you know, we are really aiming for that more equitable relationship. It's not, I'm the expert teaching you. It's really, you know, we're learning together back and forth. Um, shared decision-making power. I very much identify as a behavioral therapist, but uh, rarely, I mean, I'll certainly make suggestions, but rarely and I'm, am I saying like, you need to go for a 15 minute walk three times a week. Uh, you know, I'm saying, you know, what do you think would be a meaningful way for you to incorporate a little bit more movement into your day and really um, uh, sharing that power of decision-making. Uh, and then mutual ownership over the processes and products. So um, I, I don't know about you all, but as a therapist, I really like when there's some shared over ownership over the outcomes. One of my um, burnout behaviors is feeling like I have to uh, fix, change, control, know all things. And um, if I notice that showing up in the therapy room, uh, that's when I you know, talk to my colleagues here about my, what my burnout prevention plan is going to be. Um, so ACT is really wonderful for diverse populations, just to summarize. It's transdiagnostic. It doesn't rely on diagnosis for intervention, so it can reduce stigma. Um, we, it decreases power dynamics and encourages collaborative relationships and treatment, um, fosters acceptance of identity development processes, uh, there is a common value, lots and lots of different cultures really value the use of metaphor and storytelling, and that's a really integrated component into ACT. Um, you can also layer it onto other frameworks, so if there are other frameworks that are better fit for particular culture or um, group that you're working with, um, ACT really welcomes layering those things into the treatment. And then it's also open to multi-determined sources of suffering and causes for seeking treatment. So I wonder a little bit about that, like uh, psychologist versus social work ethics code there, you know, more like individual versus organizational responsibility um, and thinking about how that might layer on to some, uh, some of our vulnerable populations. Um, we also know that, you know, our vulnerable populations are at higher risk for pretty much all things. And so that's why it felt really important to me to include this as we're talking about ACT today. Um, all righty. So going back to that six and three in one here, um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is being present. Um, you know, this is both has to do with present moment awareness and acceptance. Acceptance meaning um, not complacency, but acceptance of things that are out of our control, things that are showing up in the moment. So um, right now, my 
heart is racing a little bit. My um, mouth feels a little bit dry. I don't like those things. I don't want those things. Part of me wishes those things would go away. Uh, but the reality is they're here with me right now. And so I'm going to notice and name them that are here. Um, but being present also really has to do with paying attention in a specific way. So on purpose and without judgment. So maybe I'm like, oh, this is terrible. My mouth is dry. This is going to be a disaster. I really want to like push that away, not accept that mouth dryness that I'm experiencing right now. But if I accept it, maybe I can take a drink of my water that's over here. Um, and then I also wanted to mention this power of the pause, just because it's really on my mind these days. This comes from Tara Brock. Um, and so a lot of, you know, the mindfulness based literature, um, but it really is putting a space between a big emotion and our actions or really anything uh, and our actions. And so I think this really speaks to the intention piece here. When I'm talking with clients, um, I will sometimes use the word mindfulness, but I'll use it really carefully. Um, I find, you know, different people have such different interpretations of what the term mindfulness means these days. And it can really get misconstrued from I think kind of the essence of what we're going for in ACT. Um, so in ACT, it really is more about being present. And certainly that can happen through formal things like meditation practices. But again, remember that overall flexibility, you know, that's only one way. We don't have to practice being present in this way. Um, I'm the slide clicker today, so I've really been practicing my present moment awareness skills as Jordan was talking. I felt really attuned to you as you were, <laughs> you were talking, Jordan, and noticed that there are a couple of moments there when my mind drifted away and it's like, oh shoot, did I click? Did I not click? You did a great job. You did a great job. We were, we, were <laughs> we had our hive mind going. <laughs> well, just noticing those, noticing those thoughts as they were showing up for me here. Um, and I really want to emphasize when we're talking about how to be present with folks in session, um, that again, there's no one, there's no right or wrong, good or bad, perfect or imperfect way to do this. So um, as practitioners, we can do this formally and informally at the start or an end of the session, within session, for practice outside of session. You know, there are many, many different ways to do this. Sometimes it's a two second thing. Sometimes it's a 15 minute thing. It can really vary a ton. Um, and I just wanted to give some different examples here. And, you know, I could probably talk all day just about this, but um, I'll just mention uh, one of these skills. So dropping anchor is maybe one that you're familiar with here. Um, and it's one that I introduced, I tend to introduce really early on to, to clients. Um, we had a question come through um, and it was just recently, so I didn't get a total chance to like attend to all of the nuance of the question, but it was talking a little bit about um, feeling emotionally dysregulated as a provider, which I can definitely um, relate to. I, I have noticed moments when I've gotten um, emotionally flooded or overwhelmed in session. And um, a really lovely thing about ACT is you can practice these things together with patients, but you can also practice these things for yourself. So um, there are like much, much longer versions of dropping anchor, but if I were to give you the TLDR version of it, if everybody, you know, if you feel like you need a little bit of grounding or present moment focus in this moment, you want to, you know, maybe push your feet down into the ground. If you're sitting, you know, pushing your legs or glutes into the chair, noticing how your back is and kind of sitting up and adjusting. Acknowledging if there's any pain or discomfort or unpleasant stuff that's showing up for you right now, anything on the inside, so thoughts or feelings or sensations, and just noting that it's there. And then noticing that around that pain or discomfort, there's also a body, this body that you can move and you can be in control of. So maybe you want to stretch your arms out or give a little neck roll, move your body in some way that feels supportive to you. 
And just notice that even with this discomfort that's here, you can still be in charge and in control of your body. Notice that around this body, there's also a whole room. So maybe there's a few things that you can notice with your eyes. I have a couple plants over here and some water, calendar, a fan. Maybe there's a couple of things you can hear. So um, my voice, or maybe there's a noise coming from the computer outside. And just notice that all of this is here in addition to that discomfort or unpleasant or unwanted thing that's also here. And you can kind of go through this as many times as you want. Feel free to come back to this at any point. Push your feet down into the floor. Acknowledge this is pain or this is discomfort. I don't want this thought. Move your body around, get more in charge, more in control. And notice what's going on outside of the body too. There are lots of different ways to practice this, but just to give you a little flavor here. I'm coming back. Um, I just wanted to connect with this idea of being present um, a bit more explicitly with burnout. Um, I'm actually going to start at the bottom point here and just mention that um, when it comes to uh, ACT work, uh, a really high degree of presence is, is required. And just acknowledging how difficult that is when we're feeling even, even minimal amounts of, of burnout here. Um, you know, it can really get in the way of uh, connecting with folks authentically, genuinely, and vulnerably. Um, and it can make it hard to be effective as a therapist a lot of times if we're having a difficult time being present with, attending to, um, and bringing our mind back to what's going on here. So a couple of things to that might be helpful in terms of practicing being present as a therapist when you're experiencing burnout, um, paying attention to how we engage and what we're teaching, noticing, am I able to be flexible with this model and these processes, or am I noticing myself becoming more rigid or more kind of grooved into certain ways of doing things? Am I embodying the process, you know, practicing like, like Jordan said, practicing what I preach here, or am I preaching for somebody else to practice? Can I engage, maybe this is a dialectical for you here, Jordan, can I engage both pain and caring at the same time? Uh, is it okay for me to like feel or experience pain? Um, either related to the person that I'm sitting with or my own? And can I hold caring alongside that? Um, and uh, yeah, can I, um, uh, can I be, uh, can I be modeling uh, this practice in session with folks? Um, for me, that comes down to a lot of vulnerability, authenticity, and genuine genuineness. Um, and if I notice myself being more disingenuous uh, uh, or not super authentic, um, that's definitely a cue to me. Um, I also just wanna mention that this can really be a developmental process for therapists. I think back to some of my training days and um, I remember I have this like image that shows up in my mind of myself as a younger therapist, like holding really tightly this clipboard and this pen in session. And a supervisor being like, Rachel, you held that clipboard the whole session and you didn't write a single thing down. Do you think maybe, <laughs> maybe next time you can try not holding onto that, that clipboard? But um, it's really hard to show up fully and authentically and flexibly in session with folks. And, you know, just know if you're just starting out with this stuff, it's okay. You know, there's a really great book act in steps that does have more of a protocol and stepwise way of doing things. Um, and you don't have to go in and just feel like I'm gonna wing it all the time, but have some things that, that ground you and kind of notice where your own developmental trajectory is. 
Um, okay, going on to opening up here and um, noticing for yourself uh, if your mind is elsewhere, if you want to bring it back here, if you're noticing yourself getting sucked into any one of those three or six things, or if you're able to kind of maintain that overarching psychological flexibility here. Um, the jargony words and act for opening up have to do with that self as context or self as observer, um, as well as diffusion, cognitive diffusion, which I tend to summarize for folks mostly as, can I separate who I am and what I do from the thoughts, feelings, and sensations that I'm having? Can I separate who I am and what I do from the internal stuff that's showing up for me? So if I have the thought, oh my God, I'm the worst therapist ever. Does that make me the worst therapist ever? Or if I have the thought, I am the best therapist ever. I crushed it that session. Does that actually make me the best therapist ever? Or does that mean I actually crushed it that session? Um, we notice that for some thoughts, we really want to hold tightly to them. I really want to be a good therapist. So I really want that thought. I want to hold it tightly when it shows up. And I really don't want to be a bad therapist or an incompetent therapist. So I really want to push that thought away. Um, but can we notice these shots showing up rather than being caught up in them? If I have the thought, oof, I could have been more effective in that session. Um, if I get caught up in it, it's quite hard to actually make meaningful changes to be a more effective therapist next time. Um, similarly, if I get caught up in the thought, I'm the best therapist, like, why would I bother changing anything? Why would I bother doing things that are important to me, like learning and growing and improving, um, if I'm really attached to that thought or if that thought is really dictating my behaviors and actions? So noticing that our thoughts are just our thoughts. Um, we are not our thoughts, even though we have amazing human brains that have the capacity to think about our thoughts, which is so cool um, and also so gets in the way sometimes. So noticing when those thoughts aren't particularly helpful. Um, and unlike some other, you know, evidence-based interventions, we're really not focusing on challenging or changing these thoughts, but just noticing them um, and noticing, are we getting jerked around by them? Are they really controlling our actions and behaviors? Or is that really, and is that really what we want right now? Or is there some kind of other thing that's more important to us? Um, that we want to not listen to that thought and take a different direction instead. Um, some cues for me is when I notice my mind being really judgmental, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, and also when thoughts feel really old or really familiar to me. Um, uh, those, are, those are some kind of clues that I'm not really embodying the opening up part of act in session. Um, I really like using this, uh, you know, anytime before, during, or after a challenging situation. Um, sometimes we might call this like an unhooking strategy. So that I don't know how the level of jargon that that feels to folks, but um, I, you know, unhook or separate from that thought. So if I'm really hooked on the thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to do a terrible, a terrible job at this presentation today. Uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, can I can I get a little bit of distance if it's right here? Can I separate from it a little bit? So I notice myself having the thought, what if I mess up? I really care about how this goes today. I also notice some other thoughts. Jordan and Rada have my back. Uh, they trust me. I trust them. I notice other thoughts like, okay, this is going well so far. I notice other thoughts feelings showing up, like mm, my stomach's kind of turning, or mm, I noticed that dry mouth again. Um, so some of the exercises that you might be familiar with here, um, passengers on the bus or apartment tenants, um, uninvited party guests, these are all metaphors that we use sometimes for the thoughts that are that are uh, in our minds. So passengers on the bus, the general just behind that, or all of these really, whether you use that, it, uh, whichever one you decide to use is um, almost characterizing the thoughts that we, have, that we have in our minds. So oh, that's that anxious passenger that just really wants me to do a good job. And I know they're trying to be helpful, but 
I got this, like I'm driving the bus today. I'm going to keep working on this and keep moving forward and, and keep talking here. Um, and we're not going to turn down that road together. Uh, and I would encourage you, you know, these are good starting places and you could act as all about open sourcing of stuff. So you can Google any of this and something reputable will come up on the internet. We've also included a ton of resources here, but I would really encourage you to be flexible about how you use these. Um, you know, I've had clients who uh, are writers and they like write out their character descriptions for some of these parrot passengers. I've had um, uh, I had a client who uh, worked in education um, and for young kiddos, and she imagined her mind as a kindergarten classroom, and that helped her be really like kind and gentle towards some of these thoughts because she would never talk to a three or four or five year old, um, you know, the way that she was treating some of these internal thoughts. So it's like, oh, I know you're trying to help there, um, but that's okay. We're not going to do that right now. Um, and that was a really, uh, that's when it kind of, you know, clicked for that person. So, you know, use your client's interests, use your own interests, um, when you're thinking about, about these metaphors here, I run. And so I always use a lot of like, uh, running analogies, whether folks like it or not, when I'm thinking about this for myself. Um, and there's a bunch of other metaphors here. Um, this is one strategy that you could use in applying this idea to yourself. So can you notice, name, and allow for that thought to be there or that feeling to be there? What internal stuff is showing up? Can you name it? Feeling anxious, I'm feeling frustrated, having the thought blank. And can you breathe into it, make room for it, allow it to be there? Um, and kind of choose with intention moving forward. Um, and I think, I'm, am I throwing it over to you now, Jordan? Yeah, so I was just going to briefly kind of take home the last act concept of doing what matters and then connect that to, you know, kind of this aspirational model. Um, I'm, I'm probably going to go through this relatively quick because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for, for RADA and walking us through IFS. So, uh, if this feels a little fast, I apologize. Happy to answer any questions uh, in the chat or, or hang out later. But so doing what matters is, is you know, uh, one of the really strong behavioral components in ACT, right? Uh, it involves matching our behavior to the areas of life that we find most meaningful. So careful attention and reflection to what is meaningful and then developing specific goals to reach that. Um, if you've never heard of values or goals, um, you know, I would be surprised that you'd be listening to this, uh, this presentation, but, um, you know, I'm sure we all have our own kind of like colloquial understanding of values and goals. I'll just kind of offer a brief definition of uh, values from an ACT perspective. Uh, Russ Harris uh, defined this in uh, one of his most recent books, Trauma-Focused Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and said values are, are your heart's deepest desires for how you want to behave as a human being how you want to treat yourself, other people, and the world around you. Um, you know, in the spirit of uh, my own training as a DBT therapist and, and valuing irreverence, uh, I also like uh, this quote from uh, this, like, I don't even know what genre he'd be, but Jelly Roll, uh, he says, uh, it's the real shit, not the other shit, right? Um, so, so values work involves careful attention to the things that are truly important to you and then developing actions uh, that are in line with that value. Goals uh, differ from values in the sense that goals are achievable. Uh, they're the aiming for what we want to, they're the aiming for, uh, you know, kind of the values we're trying to achieve. Uh, and the values are more about the how we want to get there, how we want to behave on an ongoing uh, basis. Uh, to extend Rachel's metaphor as a, a, a metaphor I really like for differentiating values and goals is this idea of a direction versus a destination. Right. So if your value is maybe heading west, um, you know, you might have goals of, you know, if you're where I am in the country, you know, reaching Denver, uh, reaching Cheyenne, Wyoming, uh, Rock Springs, Salt Lake, uh, you know, and then continuing on. Right. So you can kind of uh, you can understand how close you are to your value of heading west uh, based on, you know, kind of your goals and your destinations there. If you find yourself in Kansas City, you're a little out of alignment. So. 
doing what matters requires first knowing what matters and then taking that time to develop specific and achievable actions. Uh, you may need to remove barriers to take action, which could be both internal and external, and then mindfully participate in those actions. So even if you're doing them, you got to bring yourself fully present and be there with those actions, right? If you're on autopilot doing something that's meaningful, you're not going to uh, effectively get the most out of doing what matters. So the more that you can be mindful then uh, of even the smallest actions in pursuing values, uh, that tends to have the greater impact, right? So, uh, you know, these are things like picking up the phone to talk to a friend that you haven't spoken to for a while, even though you're tired, you've had a long day of therapy, uh, but you really value that relationship. Um, you know, even something as simple as being kind to a cashier or someone who's like been rude to you or, or something like that. Um, how to do that, we connect to values in various domains. Uh, we want to notice where our values come from, like the different values that are maybe reinforced in our family of origin. Uh, and then also notice where our values start to change and diverge as we kind of gain life experience. Uh, if you are new to values work, uh, a values card sort is an excellent place to start. There's even some apps that do that now. Um, ACT has some excellent exercises, the stuck matrix, life compass, uh, that can really help you explore and identify values. And then, you know, you can use, uh, you know, some other, uh, you know, kind of more, uh, some other skills like smart goals, things like that to develop the type of actions you'll take to reflect those values. Um, okay, I think that's what I'm going to call it on. So we'll move forward. Um, doing what matters in burnout. Uh, this is, this was just kind of my take on like, how would you get to doing what matters when you're burned out in the mental health field. So what I what I like to reflect on in this area is asking myself, where is this leading me? Like, why am I doing this? Why am I in this field and not, you know, trying to make it in the tech world or selling stuff, right? Um, why am I why am I doing this job specifically? What is it about this that I find reinforcing? What do I find meaningful here? And really reflecting on the big picture of why you got into this and the things that make you, uh, you know, make this field worthwhile. Um, ask yourself if you're doing enough of what matters for you to feel satisfied. And are you too like stuck in only doing what matters in one area of life, right? So you might find your job really meaningful, but if you're working 70 hours a week, odds are you probably don't feel like you're doing enough of what matters because there's needs to be balance in life and multiple values can be attended to at one time, even if we're just prioritizing one or two at any given point. Um, ask yourself what's getting in the way of doing what matters to you. Um, one big one that I really like in thinking about, like kind of trying to envision this like positive continuum and, and you know having values and actions is what qualities am I showing up in my sessions? How am I showing up as a therapist for my clients? Uh, what about my life outside of work? Am I giving everything to my uh, to my clients at work? And then am I emo like am I burned out and kind of an emotional emotional shell when I you know get to see my wife and daughter? Um, is what I'm doing like reflective of the sort of person that I want to be, uh, the kind of therapist that I want to be, and then is what I'm is what I'm doing workable. So workable is a term that uh, act you know uses really frequently. Workable just means actions that effectively make life richer, more meaningful. Whereas unworkable means actions that meet short term needs but worsen things in the long term. So just putting this you know kind of act and uh, this positive continuum that we've talked talked about together, you can notice that you know this this aspirational goal of learning to flourish as a psychologist can be uh, you know attended to with the act process of opening up. So noticing and naming burnout as well as the joys and areas of meaning in your work, allowing yourself compassion to feel burnout, leaning into it, fully embracing uh, the slog, the difficulties. Um, and also fully embracing personal growth. Uh, when you close out all of your charting at the end of the week, embrace that, uh, especially if it was hard. Um, and be willing to change. If you notice that the things that you were doing as a graduate student aren't working for you as like now a full-time mental health practitioner, change. Open yourself up and envision something that feels more balanced. Um, and then, you know, uh, a last part of opening up is distancing yourself from behavior patterns or beliefs. Uh, that encourage burnout or prevent you from flourishing. Uh, the one that I kind of thought about here was not taking vacation because my clients can't live without me, right? Or they're they're in too much of a crisis to step away. 
open yourself up to the possibility that they might unlock new levels of effectiveness and you'll be significantly less burned out uh, after a few days in San Diego. Um, intentionality can be, you know, uh, kind of guided by this concept of being present. Um, so mindfully choosing to participate in self-care when it, you know, that works for you at that moment. Uh, sometimes that's, you know, walking to the gas station and overpaying for Ben and Jerry's because right then, like, that's the thing you need. Be intentional. Um, maybe it's, uh, you know, canceling your afternoon clients to go for a hike with your dog. Um, be present in what you do. Notice what's showing up for you in that moment and try to match your self-care to what you need and can accomplish in that moment. Um, try to, you know, develop choice points in your self-care. So that's another act strategy I doubt we'll have time to get to it today, but um, happy to demonstrate it afterwards. Um, notice, you know, choice points. If I hit snooze on my like workout in the morning, uh, understand that I'm choosing to move my body away from feeling good and from feeling, you know, awake and alert at this time, which sometimes might be an effective choice. But for me, it, it often, you know, moves me away from, you know, my values and some of the things I want to be. So kind of like noticing those points where you choose along the way. Um, as we move into reciprocity and, and truly integrating things into life, we get into doing what matters. Uh, take stock of your values and take action in pursuing them. Consistently reflect on if your like your self care systems, your lifestyle, your work, and the the whole of you as a person and a mental health practitioner isn't doing enough of what matters. Um, are you being values consistent? Are you taking action? What barriers prevent you from doing that consistently? And then build your life worth living and live it. Take committed action uh, to build those factors and that sustain a thriving career and then let those other behaviors fall off. Um, and again, integrate those values, consistent behaviors into your life and try to resist the urge to just do everything on top of what you're already doing. Okay. All right, Rada. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Oh, thanks so much. I really, really enjoyed that. I have not uh, trained in ACT, and so this was a really lovely introduction for me, and um, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for that. Uh, and I am astounded at how many commonalities there are between internal family systems and ACT, so I'm really excited to learn more about, uh, about ACT. So um, what I will say is that the assumptions of IFS, um, uh, one of the first ones for those who are new is that um, multiplicity of mind. So I don't think I'm going to show the video I had here, um, but I want to say that um, a lot of parts of myself and a lot of people who are new to IFS um, like express skepticism about IFS. And um, I have a lot of parts that are skeptical about internal family systems that come up um, less so now as I'm more experienced with it. But um, I was brought up in a working class intellectual home where my parents read the New York Times and valued advanced education and science as the primary models for understanding the world. And the research um, with IFS is lagging, um, and especially the research around IFS for burnout is lagging when it compares to ACT and, and other bodies of literature. Um, so there is, and I would say in general, research is lagging with, with IFS. There's definitely evidence for its applicability with trauma, with substance abuse, um, and a host of, you know, other kind of disorders, but IFS is non-pathologizing. So like ACT, um, IFS really doesn't look to diagnose or focus much on um, classical assessments, psychological assessments in order to create a treatment plan. Um, the assumption when people are presenting for treatment is that they are presenting with um, parts of themselves that are, um, you know, are looking for 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 some distress um, assistance. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I have had some trouble with hoarseness today, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> so, um, what I'll say about the non-pathologizing is that. <clears throat> 
The mental health assessment, you know, is like typically organized around diagnosing pathology, which is designated according to a list of symptoms, as we know. And the IFS understanding of the mind orients our assessment just to the, the all of the parts of the mind. And um, we really are asking for permission when someone is presenting for treatment, we're, we're, present, we're asking for permission to talk to these parts of the self that are often polarized um, with other parts that are reactive to one another. Um, and so we're looking to really be very mindful and um, respectful of someone's system when we're entering therapy with someone. And um, the parts that we are interacting with, we're asking them to separate and differentiate, um, which makes room for the clients, what IFS calls self with a, cop a capital S self. Um, so we can explore how these parts serve the client. So they're all viewed as really having good intentions. Um, and, you know, this, there's an idea in IFS, I talk about there being no bad parts, no part of ourselves is bad. We're all, all of these parts are only looking for um, the survival, but also, you know, just the um, success and functioning of, uh, of our whole system as an, as an individual. Um, and, and then the goal is to um, see where, where the help is needed. Um, I'm skipping around, so I'm a little off my, off my script. Um, IFS is for everyone. And again, I see the commonalities with ACT here. Um, you know, like so many other treatment approaches, IFS was developed in clinical settings for patients with problems they couldn't resolve with the resources available to them outside therapy. Um, but Richard Schwartz um, and other therapists who I've been exposed to through trainings and in my role as a client of IFS are really transparent about how they use IFS to conceptualize their own personal experiences with their own minds. Um, and baked into the model is the assumption that the therapist providing IFS be working with their own internal system of subpersonalities concurrently as they work with their client's system. Um, this builds upon the practice of identifying therapist countertransference and other models. And in IFS, um, a fundamental behavior of the therapist before, during, and after the sessions is really checking in with self, checking in with parts, and seeing what is present and separating out so that you are able to bring to the extent that you can this aspect of yourself called self um, with a capital S that I'll talk about um, in a little while. Um, thank you. Um, I think we are going to do an experiential exercise. Um, and this will be more of a beginner exercise um, for IFS, but I think it's worth doing given that about more than 30% of the people who um, answered the poll said that they were very new to IFS. Um, so um, yeah, so what I'd like you to do is, um, Oh, I've given very little information about IFS so far, but there's a lot available in other places. So I would really like people to have an experience of what it is to experience parts because the theory of mind is really about parts and self. So what um, would be helpful is to find as comfortable a space as you possibly can for your body. Um, to really just be in as little discomfort as possible. And I invite you to close your eyes if you're comfortable with doing that and find a comfortable position. And just start by taking some long, deep breaths, just allowing your breath to lengthen. And I'm going to ask you to go from focusing externally on me and Rachel and Jordan to just focusing internally on you. 
And one way to do that is just to begin with using your breath. Just move your body around if you need to get comfortable. Your parts, as we say in IFS, live in your body. So just breathing into your body and closing your eyes, if it feels okay to do that. And the first thing I'm gonna invite you to do is to bring into your mind's eye someone who does something that you just can't help but react to. So it might be a boss or a partner, a friend, someone in your life that has a behavior, someone who acts or says something that you start to feel a strong emotional reaction or response to. And as you bring that person into your mind's eye, just invite them to do that thing or to say that thing that they do that gets the reaction moving inside of you. And just notice what happens, what starts to happen in your body. And instead of asking that reaction inside of you to stop, I invite you to just ask it to give you some more information. So we're not asking it to go away. You want to, again, just notice your body. And you might also notice what you're starting to hear yourself say to yourself, either about you or about the other person. You might start to notice that you have an impulse. You might want to say something or do something, or your impulse might be to get away but just to notice the impulse and your reactions in your body. Just allowing yourself to have this experience without judging it, if that's at all possible. And now we're going to invite the person who triggers this response in you to just fade out of your mind's eye And I invite you to experiment with this idea that all of this reaction and response you're having to this other person is actually a part of you, a protective part of you. And asking that part of you to turn towards you and to turn away from the person it's triggered by and turn turn toward you. And I'm going to invite you to ask the question of yourself, how do you feel toward this part of you? The part that is reactive to the triggering person's behavior. And just in these few moments just to see if you can find some curiosity or interest or just openness to get to know this protective part of yours today. And I invite you to interview it just like you would a person a person who deserves respect and understanding and to be known. And when you're ready, you can invite it to tell you what it wants you to know about it. What's its role? What is it worried is going to happen if it doesn't have this reaction that it's having? And really just to listen. Just to listen to what it's worried would happen if it didn't respond for you on your behalf. You could ask what's its intention. You could also ask how long it's been doing this role for you.
Seeing if you can stay curious. And if you find that curiosity is not there, just to notice what is getting in the way of the curiosity. If there's maybe another part coming forward that has some thoughts or emotions, you can shift your focus to that part and get curious about that part. Seeing if you can have some open-heartedness, some compassion for any of these parts that may be showing up for you today, right now. And asking maybe, what is this part afraid of? What is it afraid would happen if it didn't do this role? Just notice if it's giving you information about something that's more vulnerable. And just notice there's nothing to do about it. There's no need to fix it. There's possibly maybe a relationship between this maybe protective part and a more vulnerable part of you. That maybe there's a relationship that one part of you is doing to protect something more vulnerable within you. And just notice what that might feel like in your body or in your mind, you may have images or thoughts, memories, just noticing. And to keep the curiosity running, allowing yourself to just get any information that it's offering to you. whether that's big or small. And in a minute, I'm gonna ask you to come back, but just to take a moment and see if there's anything else that needs to happen inside. Is there anything you wanna to communicate to this part or these parts inside you? or anything more that they want you to know about themselves right now. And because we'll be ending this, you may want to set an intention to come back to these parts another time, just to find out more, or to treat them respectfully if they've begun to give you information that you like to be receptive to, and just to thank, thank these parts for any information they were able to give you, express or extend some form of appreciation to them. And then just begin to deepen your breath again, beginning the journey out to the external, but no rush, no rushing back, no need to rush back. Just gently coming back and when you're all the way back, just taking a minute or so to pause and I like to put my hands over my heart when I'm done doing some of this work, just to kind of create a physical a marker of an end point for my work with my parts. 
and as a, a way to kind of mark the appreciation that I have for them. It's just a suggestion, but do what works for you. So thanks so much, everyone, for, um, for your, your participation in that. And while I was doing that, I was a little too minded, as we say in DBT therapy, checking to see how much time I had, because um, I really want to make sure that I can present what I have as a contribution to the community. Um, I'm not a, an expert, but I did find out that I can go longer <laughs> and this will all be recorded. <laughs> and you don't all have to hang out if you don't want to, though you're welcome to. Um, and that includes Jordan and Rachel. <laughs> you don't have to hang out either to while I do that. But I think I will give my full presentation um, and um, and have it here. And you can, you know, if you if your time is limited, then you can come back to it and see the rest of it. So I'm going to kind of go back to the beginning and share um, share some of this and hope that Rachel can hang out <laughs> to play videos for me. Um, but yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so uh, yeah, so I will say that um, going back to just this multiplicity of mind idea, um, I'll have Rachel play this video in a moment, but I will say that um, you know, I really, um, you know, did have these skeptical parts come up for me quite a bit when I was introduced to IFS. And um, uh, I, I it, it was first developed in the 1980s by Richard Schwartz. And we're going to wait for a second to show that video, but I'm going to tell you that um, I have like never met Richard Schwartz, but I have like some personal like feelings toward him in terms of how he talks about IFS. He does quite a lot of talking about IFS um, and does so very articulately. Um, but I have to say that there are parts of me that um, the parts that see IFS as helpful, um, finding myself annoyed with his approach because he will frequently say in IFS, we believe we are all multiples. <laughs> and when I hear someone say that, I feel, you know, what he is saying is like, you know, he's referring to multiplicity of mind, but like multiple personality disorder. And I think he's trying to like, you know, kind of hook people and intrigue them and get their interest going by saying something like that. But it always like has a little bit of an annoying effect on some of my parts. Um, they get activated and uh, they like say like, oh, I really wish you would shut up about that. And you know, if you really want, you know, if you really want this model, like if you want to sell it to serious evidence-based practitioners, you need to stop with that noise. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that really IFS is not alone in suggesting multiplicity of mind. I mean, there's so many models that, um, that, that do that, you know, in, like going all the way back to Freud with, of course, the id, the ego, and the superego, but then internal objects, relations, and unions with archetypes and complexes and, um, I would add that DBT posits emotion mind, rational mind, and wise mind, and then we just learned so much. Yes, uh, we learned so much um, from Jordan and Rachel about how you know the mind is separated out and act as well. And I'd love to hear from either one of you if you have the the willingness to to talk about how how act sees the mind as multiple as well. Rachel, if you're interested. Yeah. My mind can't help but go there sometimes, but, um, you know, for me, the language around like passengers or, or things like that, I, it's, it's something I'm much more fluent with, but, um, it was, uh, easy for me to imagine like some of these parts of myself as different passengers on my, my internal bus, my mind bus, if you will. And, um, I would say it's really common when we're doing that work and act to also ask questions like, how old is this passenger? How long has it been around for? Um, Jordan mentioned like workability. So like, is it working for you or is it not? Um, so this like, uh, there's kind of this like gentle part of it sometimes. And it, that's how I interpreted the exercise anyway, that there's like, you're treating these parts with 
with compassion and kindness and gentleness a lot of times. Yeah. Um, so maybe speaking to like uh, the the like stance we take towards these different passengers or parts of ourselves. Um, not that it always have to be has to be soft. Like certainly we might have some passengers or parts that we roll our eyes at or like okay, I'm not listening to you today, or, you know, we treat with more irreverence, uh, perhaps, but, um, yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I also want to point out that, um, somebody in the chat was talking about eco states and yeah, eco states is a, a psychodynamic, um, school and, um, yeah, they use parts language in that, in that school. So, so it's not an uncommon thing. Um, but Schwartz, um, Schwartz definitely talks about that quite a lot. And, um, you know, I, I've never met him, as I said, but my second IFS therapist was trained by him. So I've got that one degree of separation. And based on that connection, I'm going to extract a repair from Dick Schwartz, actually, for the uh, we are all multiples comments, he says repeatedly, and how that affects my parts. So I'm going to show you this um, video, if Rachel doesn't mind, um, about structural family therapy developed by Mnuchin and um, his work with eating disordered clients and how um, his outcome study helped him develop this model. Terrific. So it gives you a little bit of structure for um, theoretical background for those of you who are not that familiar. So it's really a family therapist who um, was doing his PhD, working with eating disorders, doing outcome studies, and um, kind of discovered this way based on how his clients were talking about their interior experience. Um, and I appreciate um, Dick doing some of the talking for me there. Um, uh, those of you who are interested in, um, in IFS, um, it is... It is important to, um, to kind of do your own work around this. Um, this assumption that the therapist will be doing their own work um, with their own system while they're doing therapy with a client um, is work that you would have to do if you wanted to be trained in IFS after you were trained. And so, um, uh, there's a very, very long wait list for some of the training uh, that's uh, provided by the proprietary uh, organization for uh, the Center for Self-Leadership, I think it's called. Um, it's actually, you, you need to apply for a lottery just to apply for the training. So you have to be selected in a lottery to be, to apply for the training. <laughs> And I, I was told last year that there were like 10,000 people that had just entered the lottery. Um, so if getting level one training in IFS is something you aspire to, um, then um, it may take a while and there's plenty of time to kind of like explore your own system as a preparation to being an IFS therapist and being trained. I do IFS sparingly currently in my, in my current work on my caseload. Um, and it's helped me tremendously to recover from personal um, burnout in my professional life uh, as a mental health provider. And that's why I wanted to introduce it to colleagues um, because it's been so useful for me. I'm still in training. Um, I'm doing an online self-study called the online circle. There's even a wait list for that. Actually, that's been closed and there's a wait list for it. Um, but I am uh, engaged in this six month long training and I use IFS mostly with clients who are in stage two DBT um, or as part of cognitive processing therapy for PTSD, for people who are really struggling to experience their natural emotions. Um, is what CPT calls natural emotions, these um, biologically driven emotional states that are blocked by PTSD. When people are struggling with how to do that, I will use IFS to help them to experience some of that. But there is definitely a lot of, um, yes, and Regina in the chat is saying self-therapy by Jay Early is a great resource. Um, 
and I'll have a resource slide that will link to those types of um, self-therapy resources. And then there's also going to be resources around um, how to find an IFS certified therapist if you'd like to work with somebody who um, is highly trained. I found that really by beneficial as someone who came to the model, as someone who wanted to use the model for clients. That was my motivation. Um, I found it very, very helpful to be an IFS therapist, to be an IFS therapy as a client, um, to understand it from that perspective. And I, I think I'd highly recommend that as well for people who are interested in the therapy for clients. Um, so the model, yeah, posits that we are all born with subpersonalities already on, uh, on board, as well as an innate wise aspect of mind uh, that IFS calls self with a capital S. And some theor theorists uh, refer to this as core self, um, which can be helpful to distinguish it from self with a lowercase s that we use all the time. Um, and the goal is to become self-led. So to um, lead, to have a, a, a self that is leading these subpersonalities interiorly um, and has cohesion and, and cooperation. Um, because IFS posits that whenever we are feeling or thinking something, it's one of our subpersonalities that is present and expressing itself. And when we're thinking or feeling something, we're always, um, you know, in, in IFS terms, we're always along a continuum of differentiation from fusion with self or differentiation from self. And um, bear with me here, but I want to explain one more thing and then I'll show you a visual that will help maybe uh, make this a little clearer. But in IFS, um, the the personality, subpersonalities or parts are divided into three um, types, two main types, protective parts and burdened exiles. And the, the system really functions with exiles um, being primary in their influence of the other parts. So orbiting around the exiles, we have two categories of protective parts. Um, the proactive protector called a manager, which has the role of maintaining the individual's functioning despite what the exiles are feeling. And the reactive protector, which is called a firefighter, which has the role of distracting from and suppressing the emotional pain of exiled parts. Um, pain that breaks through even though the manager parts, the proactive parts are working hard. So a person might have a manager part that shows up as over controlled and when the person fails to do something perfectly or receives, let's say, feedback from their environment that triggers shame um, in the exiled part, the reactive protector or firefighter might show up and put out the flames of shame with behaviors like self-injury or binging on spending or on binging on social media or alcohol or food to numb the part, the vulnerable part, or the exile. Um, so in the next slide, I created this slide to demonstrate how I think of this relationship between parts and self. So in this slide, the self is represented by the yellow sun-shaped area, and all the other objects filling the yellow area represent parts. So there's not just one exile in, a, in most people's systems, um, there are multiple exiles, right? So created by an overwhelming emotional experience um, during our development, an exile gets created. And we often, most of us are having several <laughs> overwhelming emotional experiences as we develop as human beings. And then each one of those exiles, because the emotions are overwhelming and um, we may not be um, have the resources to negotiate this developmental stage or this developmental moment, um, other parts come in to um, protect us from the feelings there. Um, so one um, of the protective parts is a firefighter, one is a manager. And so I've got these like the little exile, like kind of contained in a canister. Um, and then the manager on the scroll and then the firefighter with the lightning bolt. Um, and the schema as a whole represents what IFS would call a burden system, a burdened system. So this image is a representation of a position on that continuum of differentiation between parts and self. And, this particular position on the continuum would be undifferentiated self, 
self and parts. The parts are blended with self here. And the goal of IFS is to differentiate parts from cells so that the qualities of self, which are highly egocentric, uh, egocentric and reinforcing to the individual, experiencing them can shine forth more freely and fully on these parts to, to have the effect of healing. And the reason for that is because in a burden system, parts, parts are driving the behavior of the individual. Usually the protective parts are driving the behavior of the individual is the assumption in IFS. Um, and it doesn't mean that the individual with a burden system is in a continuous non-functional state um, because manager parts keep most of our internal systems functioning quite well uh, from a societal standpoint, societal standpoint most of the time. But the goal of IFS therapy is to restructure the internal system or family to be cooperative and harmonious and not in reactive polarization of the subpersonalities. That's a lot for people who might be new to IFS, but I felt like it would be helpful to be able to show that. So moving on to um, the next- you know, I was just yeah. gonna say, I've got to hop off and I just wanted to say, you know, I love presenting with both of you and uh, I'm really grateful for everyone who joined today and uh, it was really nice to do this with you all. So thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Okay. Um, yeah, so the qualities of self. So um, this is kind of like the great news about IFS is that we all have these within our, the idea is that, or the theory is that we're all born with this immutable quality within us. Um, and, you know, DBT is somewhat famous for its acronyms like Dear Man and TIP <laughs> that are designed to help clients remember more easily the skills they can practice to achieve a life worth living. And where DBT uses acronyms, IFS uses alliteration. So here are several words starting with the letter C or the letter P that describe the qualities of self. And I would say that compassionate and curious are the two most salient aspects of self um, to hang on to since these are long lists. Um, in my experience, that's kind of how people can identify when am I in self? How can I tell? And in the exercise that we did when I asked you, how do you feel toward this part? That is the test in IFS for how much self energy is really present in the individual to do the work with these parts because the healing qualities of the self are what the therapist is trying to help the client access in order to do the healing uh, work. And if the client doesn't have a lot of access to self, and a lot of the work of IFS, as I understand it, is helping people to get a sense for self. Um, and when the client is struggling to do that or in that process or, or has challenges with it, it's the responsibility or the role of the therapist to be in self themselves and then lend that quality of self to the client, to the parts in the client. And so it has a modeling, um, it has a modeling kind of uh, function, I think, to it to do that so that the client kind of has some breadcrumbs to follow for what it would be like to relate to their internal parts from that sense of self in themselves. But it also is, is just assuring that there is a healing relationship happening, that the therapist is not operating out of their own polarized parts or reactive parts to the client in the therapy relationship, which don't necessarily have the healing potential that, that the self does. So, um, and I would say that, oh, I'll just um, tell you that how the, how the relationship between self and parts is described in the skills training manual for internal family systems is, um, really lovely. And so I'll just read it to you. This, this kindly relational or compassionate stance between client and the client's parts is the linchpin of IFS therapy. We've all had moments of clarity and balance when the incessant chatter inside our head ceases and we feel calm and spacious as if our mind, heart, and soul had brightened and expanded. 
At other times, we feel a wave of joyful connection with others that washes away irritation, distrust, and boredom. And Schwartz observed that the conditions for healing occur when the therapist and client achieve a critical mass of this phenomenon. So it's not necessary for all of these qualities to be present to know that you are in self, but a critical mass of these um, of the phenomena which he dubbed self and the self is neither created nor cultivated and cannot be destroyed but is rather intrinsic and present from birth. So I think the self at like that concept is really what attracts so many clients and so many practitioners to IFS in my opinion. Um, so the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, goals of a self-led system. So um, this is the goal of IFS, is to be a self-led system, uh, to have an open-hearted, curious, connected frame of mind, um, as Schwartz says, able to connect with all parts, um, connect all parts with the quality of self. Um, an internal system that has achieved a measure of harmony. Um, and in that system, parts will cooperate and cede leadership to the self, much as musicians in an orchestra look to their conductor. That has really been my experience of IFS as I've done it for myself and done it in relationship with therapists in the past. Um, and it's, it's, it's a lovely experience. Um, by the way, if you're interested in IFS for trauma as a practitioner, um, I highly recommend Martha Sweezy's article. She has a PhD in social work from Smith College and is on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. Um, she talks about the importance of having IFS in your pocket as a DBT stage two practitioner um, for people for whom um, who can't tolerate prolonged exposure or CBT trauma approaches or EMDR. Um, and especially for people who have substance use disorders or substance use that interferes with processing trauma, which is often the case with, um, with these other evidence-based trauma protocols that I just mentioned. Um, so I don't have time to talk today about how to do IFS in a session, and that isn't really the purpose of this. Um, but I do want to talk about the evidence for improved functioning on the next slide, I believe it will be. Oh, actually, this is kind of like these are the slides for that we're skipping over um, about how to do IFS. And um, it's not accurate fully because it's really like um, if you're going to, if you have a trauma history yourself um, and you want to use IFS to heal from trauma, it's strongly recommended that you have a practitioner, a trained, a light, you know, a, a, a certified IFS therapist who can do that with you. Um, so the slides I have in here are much more for solo IFS work, um, not so much for going to the exile and doing the healing work of, um, of that. I think there's one more slide on this that I should have taken this one out and wanted to focus on this one. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So, um, so we do have some evidence for IFS for burnout in peer reviewed journals, though not specifically for, uh, not specifically for mental health professionals. Um, I think that they can be general, it can be generalized pretty well. As I say, IFS is an, a new type of therapy uh, and, and the research is catching up. It's catching up quickly, I, I think, because it's such a popular therapy right now. Um, but it is catching up. Um, so this is kind of really, I think the these these studies form the kind of foundation of um, the research that I think will be coming and maybe people who are in here know of more recent research that's done, but this was what I could find. I couldn't find it specifically for practitioners, um, burnout for practitioners and its application. So I just wanted to talk, since we are an evidence-based practice, um, about the evidence for this um, application for burnout. And so, um, there is a 50 item self leadership scale and a 20 item brief self leadership scale developed by um, Steinhardt and Dolbier uh, and colleagues at UT Austin using data collected from 745 government employees. Um, the SLS was designed to measure aspects of self leadership based on the author's interpretations of the qualities of core self um, and the uh, inter, the internal reliability was high um, for that measure. The construct validity was high. Um, 
I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not super familiar with um, all of that. Like, you know, uh, it, it's been a long time since I did that piece of my training and I don't practice it regularly, but um, it does seem like the evidence is, is, um, is strong so far. Um, there's another uh, paper, the relationships between self-leadership and enhanced psychological health and work outcomes. And this, um, this was two cross-sectional studies that were conducted to examine the correlations between the concept of self-leadership as described within the framework of IFS um, and enhanced psychological health and work outcomes. Um, pretty, um, pretty good sample size. I, I, would say, you know, it's not an N of, of five here. Um, so we've got 270 in one um, study and 160 in the other. And um, they defined, um, they defined um, a better health status uh, based on perceived wellness, less perceived stress, fewer symptoms of illness. Um, and then this uh, third study with Robinson um, used a sample of 109 respondents um, completing the self-leadership scale and the work addiction risk test um, and the job burnout scale. And a positive relationship was found between workaholism and burnout and an inverse relationship between self-leadership and the firefighter behavior of workaholism. Um, they used the work addiction risk test. This was a very early study. The, the work addiction risk test is a 1998 measure, very old measure at this point, 25 item inventory. So for any graduate students in the audience who are interested in research, um, IFS is a, a really uh, you know, wide open field, I think in many ways um, right now um, where you could get a lot of experience and uh, contribute a lot to the field. So um, I wanted to show you some IFS session um, examples. Um, and one of these is the therapist unblending his own parts from self before the session, which will give you a little bit of a, an idea of more of what I was talking about, about the importance of your own work. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so I think I will, um, I will not have us play the rest of those currently. This is just a nice example and the links will be in the, in the recording so you can watch those on your own, but it is a nice example. Derek Scott is a, um, an IFS, a level three certified IFS Canadian therapist. He's a, so she has a social work training background and he is a trainer and a consultant as well and has a really lovely style. And Tammy Sollingsberg, I, Berger, I think her name is, is also an IFS therapist. I think she is a licensed clinical mental health counselor, and she is an IFS therapist as well, and has a podcast called The One Inside, um, where she um, interviews people who are IFS practitioners. Um, so it's a nice learning slide for those of you who are new to IFS. Um, the next slide, um, I just wanted to talk about like what um, appeals to my values um, as, a, as a person um, with IFS. It is kind of an open sourced um, therapy model and um, there's lots of innovation happening. Um, these legacy burdens are defined as um, international transmissions of extreme feelings, uh, emotions, energies, and beliefs. And um, IFS has a uh, partnership with Black Therapists Iraq that is um, has a that organization has uh, the mission of healing the healers, reversing racial trauma by healing the healers, and fostering self compassion, confidence, and inner peace for Black healers. Um, they've created a partnership with um, with the uh, institute. Um, with the IFS Institute to spread the IFS model to underrepresented communities and more specifically to black communities across the United States. And they have very heavily um, discounted scholarships for IFS trainings for um, black therapists, for BIPOC people in general, and then also for LGBT, LGBTQ plus IA um, uh, identified 
folks who are interested in being trained as well. So they're doing a lot to make this accessible. And IFS also, um, unlike a lot of other therapies, makes um, the training accessible to people who are not mental health uh, practitioners. So massage therapists or coaches um, are eligible to be in this lottery of 10,000 people, which is why I think there's 10,000 people in them. Um, and so when you're looking for your own IFS practitioner, if you're particular about having somebody who was trained in mental health um, through, you know, an accredited university or whatever it is, um, you know, you just have to kind of know that there's a lot of practitioners out there that are not necessarily trained in the same way that the folks who are probably uh, on this on this uh, presentation today are, are being trained or are trained. So, um, so I wanted to also let you know from that last slide that the IFS is used in MAPS, which is the, um, the MDMA phase three FDA research for psychotherapy uh, for trauma that's being done. And um, there's some risks with using IFS, uh, sorry, risks with using MDMA um, for healing trauma that Richard Schwartz talks about in this video that I think are important and I have not found them talked about in very many places. So I just wanted to put that out there because I know that psycho, uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for trauma is um, very prominent right now, um, especially with ketamine. And um, there are definitely some things that people who use IFS with clients can help them to prepare their protectors because psychedelics tend to go to the exile without, and they bypass the protectors, and then there can be backlash afterwards, um, is what Schwartz is talking about. So I just thought I would provide that for people who are interested. And then, yeah, the last slide is really just going into resources. There's a very broad um, set of resources here um, as uh, just trailheads for you for how to find um, more solo IFS, self IFS kind of resources, um, if you want to do your own work in this area, and then also evidence based um, resources as well. So, um, and then there's training for IFS. And I, I want to kind of like, I know I have time because it's being recorded, but I want to respect people's time and really um, wrap things up now. So I'm going to do that. And I know that Jen has a couple of slides that she wanted to share with us, but um, I really appreciate everybody's. Um, and then I don't know if Rachel, you wanted to do the, I don't, I'm not sure where we're going next, but let's figure it out. I think I just wanted to mention like, because of time, we won't do this together. Um, but I just wanted to mention that one experiential I was hoping for us to do was, was for everybody to be able to take away a bit of a personal, um, sample burnout or personal burnout awareness and action plan. And um, I'll have Jen magically somehow get this to all of you to be able to do on your own. So I'm big on therapy homework or practice. So consider this your practice after this, uh, this presentation, if you want to continue your learning in this way. Um, this is just a sample, but uh, one that's very genuine, authentic to me. I, I mostly um, just share what this looks like for me and think about it like a, you know, green, you're good to go, yellow, you're on the cusp, and um, red, you're, you're past burnout. So um, these are examples, both of the internal stuff that shows up in your mind, in your body. Um, we didn't, like Jordan said, get to the choice point, but away moves are moves that are ineffective or values inconsistent um, in our actions and behaviors. Uh, and then towards moves would be those behaviors or actions that are either effective or skillful or values consistent. And I don't know if you can see me, but um, I have a blank one for you too. So we'll send that your way for you to do on your own. Um, like Rada, I didn't want to do it in the middle. So I just included some general act resources. Not of all, all of them are like the exactly pertinent to what we talked about today, but I have such a collection I wanted to, to share and some that I really like an awful lot. Um, and then same, some resources for burnout specifically. Jordan had mentioned one measure earlier. I've also used the ProQual before. 
Um, and then there was this cool, like, you know, very, not super empirical, but um, self-care assessment. And then one um, related to more organizational strategies. If you happen to be working as a part of a system and we're interested on some more uh, systemic kinds of interventions that you could do in your workplace, please feel free to um, contact us with any questions. I, I think any of us would be more than happy um, to talk with you. Uh, we were a little too ambitious in our quantity of information today, but um, I think it comes from a place of passion and excitement and curiosity and a love of lifelong learning. So um, this was a real pleasure. Thank you all so, so much for being here with us today. And thank you, Radha. I, I loved learning from you about IFS and I feel fortunate that I get to keep chatting with you about it. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your patience with us. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.